yeah, I mean, we're living in a moment when governments have bailed out big banks. They've bailed out the richest people in our society, the bankers, and are telling the ordinary citizen and often the poorest within society, you've got to pay for it. Norina Hertz is schrijfster, activiste en hoogleraar economie. Zij vertelt in het komend kwartier over schuld, leningen en het Gucci-kapitalisme. Welkom bij Tegenlicht Talks. Debt um, is something that we come across all through our lives. Debt, so when a parent give, um, lends a child money, when you lend a friend money, um, if you buy a house and you need to get a mortgage, if you are a government and you're borrowing money so that you can invest in roads, in railways, in infrastructure, um, these are all situations of debt when somebody has and gives and somebody borrows and has to pay back. Yeah, I think what's happened is that there's been um, a shift in attitude from your parents' generation, you know, who are telling you, um, don't ever get in debt, you know, don't spend more than you can afford, um, to this contemporary generation, you know, who really have a very different um, whole view of the acceptability of being in debt. So. In the United States, for example, the average number of credit cards that people have are nine, you know, so you, which is quite incredible when you think of it. So, you know, carrying all these different debts, and I think part of it, part of the problem has been that in this past era of capitalism that I call Gucci capitalism, you know, an era in which it became more shameful to not have a pair of Nike sneakers or not have your latest Gucci handbag, um, much more shameful to not have those than to be in debt. In that sort of a society, um, people were just borrowing and borrowing and borrowing much more than they could afford to repay just because they wanted to have the status symbols um, that society was so overvaluing. Now, well, now we're facing a situation where um, governments are obsessively trying to reduce their debts um, and in the process, I would argue, creating potentially even bigger problems than they inherited um, because we're now in a global economic downturn, you know, bordering on recession and have been for a really long time. Um, what we need clearly is uh, to have governments actively investing now in the economies so that economies are growing again and instead governments are now kind of obsessively trying to slash their debts right at a moment where doing so could potentially really destroy any hope for their countries. And you know, we see at the moment protests in the streets on a regular basis in countries like Greece, you know, which are in, which are implementing draconian auster austerity measures um, at a time where unemployment's already at completely unacceptable levels, where youth unemployment is at 60% in Greece. Um, so, so, so I think now debt, the repaying of debt, paradoxically, now is the problem in this moment of downturn. Like, this isn't the moment to be repaying the debt. This is the moment to be focusing on how do we invest in our economy and grow. The reality is there's always, the reality is there is always money. Um, governments, as we see, are pretty good at creating money when they need to. Europe's in a much harder, I mean, I'm speaking now with my 
UK, my British perspective on, well, we have a currency that we can do stuff with. So, you know, in the, in Britain or in the United States, there is some, there's, there is more flexibility for individual governments um, to manoeuvre because they can essentially do what's called quantitative easing, so they, which is effectively print more money. Um, so they can find money to do things. Europe is, of course, different because governments don't have such power over um, their own currencies. But still, um, you know, I think real leadership at this point in Europe would be setting boundaries as to what, what was and what was not acceptable to impose on their population. So it's not slashing public spending in a boom time when, people, when there's lots of jobs and the private sector's um, playing its role. It's, it's in a downturn when the private sector is not playing its role. So just at the point where you need government intervention, and this is you know, not from a philosophical perspective of liking or wanting government intervention. There are just moments when it makes sense that you need more government. Just at that moment, the IMF is coming in and going, no, we don't want you to, cut, uh, to spend money on unemployment benefit, on social safety nets, on um, hospitals, on healthcare, on education for, um, for mentally ill children. I mean, these... and. Unfortunately, always in this in these kind of situations, it is the most vulnerable in our society who lose their funding. When the government reigns in, it's not the top one percent in our society who suffer; it's the bottom ten percent. I think an interesting potential kind of future scenario is maybe looking at Argentina as a, as a um, case, as a historical case study, because Argentina, you know, is more comparable to a Europe. And, um, and what we saw in Argentina was when they had a debt crisis and were supposed to be repaying significant monies um, to the West, and the IMF came and said exactly what they're saying to Greece and said, you know, no, we will help you if you privatise any assets that you have and if you stop spending on public se sector spending. Um, Argentina, they actually said, no, we're not going to do this. We're not going to play ball. Um, we are going to risk, we're going to default on our debt. We won't pay it back. And at the time, all the commentators were saying this is the most disastrous move and Argentina is putting itself into a hundred years of um, negative growth and it's going to be a basket case economy and the first year was tough because um, when a country defaults on their debt it has got you know, serious ramifications in terms of what even private companies can borrow then from that from that country so the first year was tough but after one year Argentina picked up and picked up and picked up and um, and has you know been doing compared to Europe incredibly well over this period so so there are precedents of governments saying no we will not accept this one of the problems um, of the past era of capitalism has been the short-termism that was inherent in it. Moving forward into a co-op capitalism era, um, one of the reforms needed is for investors and pension funds and institutional investors to be able to value the long term much more in their investments. That's really hard for an investor to do at the moment. You know, they are rewarded only on um, how a, com how a company they invest in does over a day, a week, at the most a month, two months. Um, so companies are not able to, th investors are not able to think long term. Companies don't think long term. Um, so that would be a, a kind of specific thing that would be needed. How do we get companies, investors to focus on the long term? What policies are needed, what incentives are needed. Another reform is of course around um, in the area of corporate governance around boards of companies. Um, you know, how do we ensure that management and executives are 
making decisions that are fair and right and are not um, not harming their um, employees and also um, and also taking kind of far too big a share of the pie themselves and that's where you want to have boards that are functional um, in a way that boards clearly haven't been over the past decade um, where you have people on the board who say hang on a minute you know it's not right that this CEO is earning this much money or um, it's not right that um, that we're investing in a mine that's going to um, be employing child labourers in Africa so yeah some more oversight as well. Right. So there are tangible things that are needed. Well, I think we need to move much more towards what I call co-op capitalism, um, which is essentially reconnecting capitalism and the economy with social justice. It's about revaluing the importance of relationships within society, whether within business, but within society as a whole. It's about um, valuing um, public goods um, explicitly again. Um, so um, forests, um, parks, um, public spaces become valued, not just um, because they're worth something as assets, but because they contribute to a sense of social cohesion. And it's about, um, co-op capitalism is about recognising that the old narrative that competition was the only way for companies to succeed and grow isn't necessarily right. And that cooperation and collaboration actually are very well-suited business models for our times. We see a whole host of collaborative businesses um, on the internet and models, whether it's um, crowdsourced models like Wikipedia, whether it's sites like um, couchsurfing.com where people come together and trade places to stay. I mean, we're just seeing all of these different types of models emerge which are doing well, um, which are better than the old models and are embracing a kind of cooperative ethos. So I think it's a moment where we can look forward and think, actually, not just for ethical reasons, but actually um, if we want to do best as a country globally, um, it's time to start imbuing and adopting more and more cooperative values um, into this next phase of capitalism. I think it is actually quite incredible if you start adding together all the critiques that are being levelled at capitalism right now. I mean, in all these years that I've been thinking about capitalism and democracy, um, this does feel like a particular, like a very distinctly different moment where we have, um, you know, where you have the financial, when you have a period where the Financial Times is running a series of articles on capitalism in crisis, where you have, um, commentators from the right as well as the left admitting that there are problems with the current system where you have Alan Greenspan, the former chairman of the Fed, um, admitting that the models on which he based his analysis were flawed. I mean, I think there is something distinctly different. And when you add that to a rise in protest, um, so there is a groundswell movement calling for something different and you add to that that actually different models of capitalism or economic systems have been doing better than our system you know whether it's China or whether it's Brazil or whether it's Scandinavia I mean they've all been doing better than um, than than our Gucci capitalist models so when you add all of that together I think this is a moment of real potential for change. My, my parents always told me you shouldn't um, spend money you don't have at all. Um, that's very Dutch. That's very Dutch. <laughs> Probably, yes. 